question. If all of your friends are buried in debt, does that mean it's okay? Keep watching for this important discussion. Hi, I'm Liz Namofsky, host of Finances Personal. Are you in debt and are you assuming that everyone you know is in debt so it makes it okay? Or on the flip side, are you worried about debt and don't know who to speak with first? Right now, we have many individuals who are either drowning in debt and others that are squirreling away all of their funds. And it seems like there's a dichotomy between people who are struggling and people who are feeling fine. We all have a relationship with money, but is it a healthy relationship? Today, I'm joined by Stacey Janczak-Waleski, Director of Education and Community Awareness at Credit Counseling Society, to discuss why being in debt is so hard and embarrassing. So Stacey, let's first begin. Um, let's talk about what credit counseling is because a lot of people don't know and how much does it cost? Yes, that's a great question. So credit counseling is, is services that are available to a consumer so that they can understand what's going on with their money and also if they're running into debt, you know, come up with some options. <clears throat> now it's really important that we differentiate between nonprofit credit counseling and other credit counseling. Um, as you can appreciate, and I know, I, you know, I was watching one of your shows earlier um, with uh, the licensed insolvency trustee, mm -hmm. and she had been talking about, you know, some bad players. And so it's really, really important that people understand the difference between nonprofit versus for-profit. So our organization, the Credit Counseling Society, is a nonprofit charity. And what we do is we serve people in three different ways. So Liz, we serve them by providing free credit counseling. So we'll meet with anybody to talk about their money. We provide low cost debt solutions. And number three is we do financial education, which is my department. Excellent. And you know, that's why I do this show because I think it's it's really important. There's so many companies out there. And as you said, there's some good actors, some bad actors, mm -hmm. but a lot of people don't know where to go to. And if they've heard a bad story from a friend or a family, they're mm -hmm. reluctant to reach out and go. And that's why, you know, I'm really happy with your explanation because people understand now what, you know, what your organization does mm -hmm. and why you're there to help them. Absolutely. And you know, the thing about money is that there's so much shame involved with money is that it's hard to reach out for help. And so when people reach out for help, it's important that they're getting the right help. <clears throat> and that okay. requires them. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, well, let, let's talk about that. Yeah. You know, people find it very embarrassing when they're in debt. And you know, there's a huge stigma attached to it. And with the embarrassment of stress, anxiety and everything else, why do people feel so embarrassed? You know, I think what we've learned over the years, um, you know, through our families and society and media, et cetera, is that money is now equated with self-worth. Yeah. So if I have wealth, then I have higher self-worth, right? If I am impoverished, I have, you know, no, I, I don't want to say no, but you know, very well, I, right. Yeah. Um, and then if I've got debt, what does that say about me as a person? Yeah. Am I lazy? Am I a bad decision maker? Do I not take care of my family? You know, so on and so on. And so you can appreciate where if somebody goes, I've got debt, and then they go right into this shame spiral and they go down hard and fast. And the thing about shame, especially when it comes to money, is shame keeps us silent and it keeps us, you know, from reaching out for help. We start to turtle right? We go in, we protect, and we just stick our heads in and hope for the best. And, and as you know, Liz, like with money, you know, hoping for the best is not a good plan. Yeah. And you know, some, something you just said is, is really important. You know, we start having this thought process mm -hmm. and how many of us have this thought in our head and it becomes negative and it gets oh, even yeah. deeper negative and mm -hmm. worse. Like it just gets deeper and deeper. But the only thing is, yeah, we are the only ones that, that understand or hear the negativity. Mm -hmm. But if we don't speak to somebody and, and get help, that negativity will make it debilitating for us. But we're the only ones that hear that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're bang on. And the thing is, I mean, I always say like my, I see my job, like my purpose is really to open the closet door and shine that light on debt and shine the light on shame around debt. Because, you know, as you said, it's so easy to go, okay, I've got debt. Now I'm a bad person who can't make good decisions, who's lazy, doesn't take care of their family. So I don't deserve help because I'm worthless. Yeah. Wow. For just having some debt, like that's a big, <laughs> that's a big draw. And, it, like, it's, and the thing is, mm -hmm. I mean, it's that negativity in our head that we're the oh only ones here. 
That's right. And then that's the thing is we think we're the only ones that have the problem, yeah. right? I always say to people um, when I teach, in, well, I do it with webinars too, but when I teach in person, I get everyone to stand up at the beginning and I go, you can sit down if anything is true for you. I'll ask you three questions. One, were you born with manage, money management talent, like Gretzky and hockey? I'm from Edmonton originally, so I kind of, I think Gretzky's kind of mine. <laughs> like, you know, he's a talented dude. Okay, are you like him with money? Most people are not. Great. Number two, did you have parents who taught you how to raise your money well? Or it taught you how to um, manage your money well while growing up? Most of our families didn't talk about money. Yeah. I know mine didn't use words. They used shame and emotion around it. So you could always feel this tension, but you never had words to put to it on what the problem was. Yeah. So that's how I grew up. And then the third question is, did you have teachers who taught you how to manage your money well? Well, no, it wasn't part of the curriculum. So then I joke and I say, so what's the hope here? You get, you turn 18, get your first credit card and upon first swipe, which I know dates me <laughs> or first tab what like magical green, you know, financial literacy fairy dust flies into our face and boom, we're illiterate. No. And that's where you see so many adults, so many Canadians struggle with money it, and the shame keeps them silent and it keeps them not reaching out for help. You know, it's, it's really interesting that you said, you know, you're 18 and you get your first credit card. I mean, I was told in school that in order for me to have a credit score and, and be on the credit map, I needed to go get a credit, a yeah. credit card. Mm -hmm. So we're told to go and get one, but we're not told how to manage it. Oh, no. Well, and I don't know about you, but I remember going through driver training when I was like, you know, 14, 15, and then I got my license at 16. I had to go through like training for it to drive a, a car. Yeah. Fair enough, right? I'm grateful for it. But how are we handing credit cards with $1,000 plus to people who aren't understanding it. I know I'm not opposed to credit. I have a credit card in my wallet. Um, but I, what I, you know, it's about using it wisely because credit's not good or bad, right? Yeah. It just is. It's how we use it that makes it good or bad in our lives. So how much debt is too much debt then? <laughs> good question. <laughs> you know what? There's not a number. It's a matter of perception, right? And that's what I think is so interesting about money is that it's about how you, it's not the dollars and cents. Like the dollars and cents don't mean anything until they do, yeah. but it's how you feel about the dollars and cents that that's what drives your behavior. And so in terms of too much debt, I will always get people to do a gut check, right? Are you feeling tense about it? Are you, you know, it's all the signs, right? Are you making minimum payments? Do you have any savings? Are you using payday loans? Are you fighting with your person? Because yeah. nothing says love like a good money fight, oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> at 11 o'clock at night, I find is the best time. <laughs> <laughs> when you can't call anyone, <laughs> you just have to stew about it all. Well, wait, we'll, we'll get to that point. Yeah. But, you know, I was going to say, uh, uh, just comment on something that you just said. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people say, well, if I just made more money, I'd be out of debt. Yeah. And I've talked to people and said, okay, so if you have somebody who makes forty thousand dollars and spends thirty and saves ten of it, and if you have somebody who makes a hundred thousand dollars and spends hundred and ten, mm -hmm. who who is in the in a better position? Like more oh, money does, mm -hmm. is not helpful. More money does not mean that you will have less debt. No, you know, I, I look at it like, you know, I'll take this cup, for example, my cup of water. Okay, I'm not going to poke holes into it. But let's just say, you know, if I poke holes, and these are all my expenses. Yes, I've got some options, I can keep pouring more water, which is money. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I can start plugging a couple holes, right. right. And so it's not about not spending or not having what you want. It's about making intentional choices about what you do want and living that life. So you get what you want, because you're living your financial values. That's such a great analogy, you know, with that big cup and, mm -hmm. and poking holes and then just mm -hmm. plastering them up so that, you know, you have a foundation and you have, yeah. you have, you know, some things that'll support you. Mm -hmm. um, that, now let's go back to, uh, you were talking about couples. Mm -hmm. A lot of couples don't talk about money. No. It's a taboo or, you know, either, um, you know, one partner takes care of it. The other one doesn't mm -hmm. want to know about it. Um, and I'm a firm believer that couples need to discuss money. They need to talk about money. I think women should also have their a separate bank account. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They should have a joint with their partner, but mm -hmm. something separate as well, because, yeah. you know, that gives you a little bit of freedom or mm -hmm. um, an independence independence. Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, I'm a firm believer that couples should talk, but a lot of couples think that it's just too hard to talk about money. Mm -hmm. And what, Mm -hmm. what is your thought process here? Yeah, it is hard. As a married woman, I've been married for 21 years and yeah, it's hard. (laughs) You know, and I, my husband knows, cause I, I take him, I take him with me everywhere. I talk and teach and stuff. So he knows I talk about him behind his back, but (laughs) money's really hard. Like that. But money's hard, right? Because my, hu- I'm, I'm going to use our, our marriage, for example. My husband was raised in a family that has a certain set of money values, certain personalities, certain value, um, beliefs, and certain, um, almost like a, you, get, you have a family culture, if you will, and you can have a family culture around money. You know, think about the messages we heard, you know, money is evil or money's dirty or money, you know, you're one paycheck away from a welfare line or whatever the messages are, right? So my husband has all that baggage in his backpack, but let's not forget, I've got all my baggage in my backpack because I had parents and I was raised with money and on and on and on. So now, you know, hey, we're in love. So of course it's going to work out, right? We smush our accounts together because we're in love. It should be fine. Yeah, it's absolutely not fine because money's not about the money. It's about the value that we put on it, yeah. right? And if my husband spends and I don't know about it and it goes against my values because I think he shouldn't be spending, well, that's where a money fight gets in, right? Because his values are different than mine. So a lot of couples fight about it, but we fight about the wrong things. We fight about like, you spent this, what about this? And what we really need to get into is let's talk about how you what money means to you. How were you raised with money? Like, what do you believe about money? You know, I had to realize, um, you know, I'm a certified coach. And, you know, one of the biggest lessons I learned in coaching is nobody's trying to be a jerk. Most people are just trying to live out like people are just doing the best that they can. Yes. And then I had to apply that to my own marriage, Liz, and say, oh, yeah, my husband's not doing this to be a jerk and spite me. He's doing it because it aligns with his values. Yes, they may be different than mine, but he's not doing it to be a jerk. So if I can get to that foundation that he's not a jerk, then I can actually go, okay, can we talk about what this is, what's going on? And can, can we create a, a solution that works? We need to satisfy my need for you know, savings and security, mm-hmm. but we need to satisfy his need to live for today and be able to have that freedom to spend. Okay, now that we know that, we can come up with a solution. But instead, if we just fight about the money, we never get down to what's really going on. And, and you know, hard. I, I think what you just said is really, really important because I've talked to a lot of couples. They've been married a really long time. I've only been married two years coming mm-hmm. up. So I haven't, I don't have the 21 years that you have, right. but um, we talk about mm-hmm. money. We talk mm-hmm. about bank accounts. We talk about investments. Um, you know, we talk about the future. So we, yeah. we are one of the couples that do discuss money on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, and I've talked to a lot of friends too, and said, you know, you've got to talk to each other. And a lot of them are like, I don't know how to begin. Like, I don't Mm -hmm. know how to start. So what would a starting point be? Oh, a great question to start with is first of all, if you've got kids, make sure they're in bed and everything's nice and quiet, dim the light, pour yourself a glass of whatever interests you chill out. You know, this is not, you don't want to have a money conversation whenever, you know, it's stressful. So just chill and then just start with like, Hey, babe, tell me about how you were raised with money. Like, what was it like growing up with money? Like, you know, in your family and then just let him or her, you know, let them tell the story and then, let, you know, and then you tell your story about what it was like. Okay. We're not blaming anybody. We're not fighting. We're just talking. We're trying to understand that we're not jerks. Okay. <laughs> so, and then another one is like, Hey, you know, where do you see yourself in five years? Like, what do you want financially in five years? Because dreaming is fun, right? It's big picture. It's hopeful. It's optimistic. Instead of you spent this and I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to break your golf club. (laughs) Start with the soft stuff. How were you raised? What do you want? And then we can get into the other stuff. You know, that's really important. And I think this is a really good, uh, your answers are really good because people can relate to that. Yeah. And, you know, as you said, it's, it's more history and it's more listening. Mm-hmm. And that's something that we yeah. really need to understand. We need to mm-hmm. listen to each other a little bit more. We need to be a little bit more patient, mm-hmm. step back and listen. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. So um, a lot of questions, like I see uh, a lot of people talking about um, 
co-signing for someone mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. They're, um, they think, oh, you know, my, my son or daughter are um, getting a new home. I'm going to co-sign a mortgage for them, or I'm going to co-sign a car for, for my partner. Um, can you maybe explain exactly what co-signing is and the mm-hmm. repercussions when, you know, bills don't get paid? Sure. So I'll take, um, I'm going to use my brother because I actually never talk about him. So I'm going to pick on Sean. (laughs) So let's (laughs) use Sean as an example. Him and I are siblings. And let's say Sean needs a co-signer because his credit is not good enough. Mm -hmm. So what the bank is doing or the credit union is doing is they're asking for more security um, because they want to reduce their risk, right? Banks are in business for two reasons, make money and reduce risk, which is fine. So because my brother maybe doesn't have good enough credit and he's a high risk, right? I'm a better risk because I've got better credit. They're going to ask me to come on board. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's pretend I actually like, I do like my brother a lot. I love him. He's a great (laughs) friend of mine, but let's pretend I say yes. Okay. If I say yes, then we both sign the contract. Now my brother, Sean will make his payments, but let's actually, my brother lives in um, Alberta and he's in the oil patch. So as we can appreciate the employment goes up and down. So let's say my brother loses his job. Okay. Now he can't make payments. The, the bank's not worried, right? Because they've got me on, on the, on the loan. So mm-hmm. now I have to make the payments, right? So I may be angry at my brother, but I am still legally responsible for those payments. Okay. And that's what people don't understand. And then here's what happens even worse is that let's say things go really south for my brother and he's got to declare bankruptcy or he can, he's just got a default. He can't do it. The bank's not worried because I have to pay the whole freight. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the challenge with co-signing is that, you know, I'm not one to give, you know, advice or tell people what to do. That's not really my job um, or my preference. But for me, it's about understanding very clearly, A, what you're getting into, what you're going to do when it goes south, and how can you preserve that relationship? Because all of them are impacted. And I think that's really important because it's, it's understanding um, which a lot of people don't, p- people don't read fine print, or nope. if they are explained something, they may not understand it fully. Mm-hmm. So the whole understanding part kind of gets lost. Yes, and absolutely. I-, I love the way that you've explained it, because I think it's important for people to, you know, understand the steps to it. Um, because co-signing isn't just, you know, putting your name, I'll, I'll just second it type of thing. No, no, you're responsible no. for it. The whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if it goes south, can you maintain the relationship with the person you co-signed? I don't know about anybody else, but I will have a lot of difficulty maintaining, like, I will have a lot of difficulty not being really persnickety about things between my, like, it will create a lot of tension between my brother and I, if he can't pay and I've got to pay the whole shot. Of course. Now, Mm -hmm. okay, so we're talking about debt. What options do people have to pay back debt? Yeah, the good news is there's always options. You know, when it comes to debt, the numbers will dictate the solution, right? So it's not whether I like you or don't like you. It's just the numbers. Mm -hmm. So I always put it in three buckets when I explain it to people. You know, the first bucket is the DIY, right? The do it yourself. Okay. You can handle things on your own. So maybe that's a budget. You know, a little quick story. I was teaching at a local uh, college and I do an an exercise with uh, students that say, okay, you be the credit counselor. I'm going to be the person in debt. Let's brainstorm. And it started to stall out. And I said, it starts with me. And the student puts his hand up right in the front row. Well, bankruptcy. And I just wanted to say, Liz, dude, it's called a budget. (laughs) No, we don't need that just yet. Let's budget, (laughs) right? So, you know, increasing income sometimes, you know, sometimes you do need to pour more water into, you know, the cup. Sometimes it's plugging those holes and decreasing expenses, right? Conventional financing is an option for some people, you know, refine. We know a lot of people are refinancing their mortgages because the rates are low. Yeah. Right. So those are options. Sometimes it's help from family and friends selling assets. I mean, not this, this is a cheap silver ring, but you know, some people have jewelry or art or antiques that they can sell. But a lot of people and, have things hanging in their closet too, yes, that they've impulse yes. purchased and mm-hmm. the, the tags are still on there. And mm-hmm. this is a perfect opportunity to raise money yep. to get rid of debt. Yeah. Well, and you kill two birds with one stone, right? You Marie Kondo your closet yeah. and now you have a nice clean closet and you can make some money. Yeah, it's a great idea. You know, sometimes, you know, and there's also a communication strategy. If somebody cannot truly afford their payments and maybe they're on government benefits, then it's communicating with creditors to let them know what's going on. 
But let's say those don't work. So now we move into the middle bucket and this is where there's some assistance and intervention. And it's stuff that we can help, you know, at the Credit Counseling Society with consumers. And it's called a debt management program. And so what it is, it, we actually pool debt because we're licensed debt poolers. So a consumer can come to us. I'm just making up a story. Maggie comes to us. She's got $50,000 of debt. And, you know, in working with her budget, we realize that she can actually afford a payment. But what she needs a break on is the interest. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is set that up with her creditors. So we will put proposals out to creditors. We have national agreements, so they typically accept. And then Maggie stops paying her creditors, and they're okay with that because she makes one payment to us, and we take those funds, and we disperse them to her creditors. Wow, okay. Yeah, and what they do is they actually give her a break on the interest. And, you know, the big banks that we all complain about, they drop a 19.9% credit card down to zero. The payday loans will go down to zero, right? And if you're in a payday loan trap, you are in. So to get the interest drop to zero is helpful. It's very and, helpful, especially those payday loans where they've got, you know, what is it, 300% oh, yes. interest. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So what that does is that allows a consumer to get out of debt in a reasonable amount of time. And, you know, part of my department is, you know, is also getting uh, the benefit of financial education. So that, you know, I joke that, you know, we love our our clients. We just don't want to love them for a long time, right? Like, (laughs) respectfully, I don't want a 20 year relationship with a client. That means I'm really not doing my job. Right. So, and then of course, the last set of options are the legal options. And that's where a consumer you know, we would refer a consumer to a bankruptcy trustee or a licensed insolvency trustee to either file a consumer proposal or a bankruptcy, because that's the solution they need, because that's what the numbers dictate. So, So oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say there are options always available. But what we've noticed is that, you know, a consumer will go from decline from a consolidation loan to, oh, no, I need to go bankrupt. And we encourage people to talk to a professional, right? Because bankruptcy is an option and thank goodness for it in Canada, we've got that legal option. It's not the first one (laughs) as that student, you know, raised his hand in the the workshop said. And that's why I wanted to do two shows. I did one on credit counseling uh, and one on um, trustee, trustee, Mm -hmm. I've just yeah. drawn a blank. Ins- insolvency mm-hmm. trustees. License insolvency trustees. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and that's why I wanted to do these mm-hmm. two shows because <gasps> I think it's important for people to understand because quite frankly, I didn't really know, you mm-hmm. know, what both roles were. Sure. And now that I've done the shows, I am more aware of, you know, mm-hmm. who does what. Yes. Um, and they are both good organizations but as Mm -hmm. we said earlier there are there are good and bad actors just like there are in every other industry so Mm -hmm. you know come out ask questions and do your research I mean that's the most important part of it absolutely Um, is one of the questions I had is is there a limit on how long a debt can be collected on is there expiry or yes there is thank goodness so most provinces are two years most Um, Some provinces, so for example, Manitoba is a six-year statute of limitation. Uh, The North is six years as well. I haven't done my research on Quebec and Atlantic Canada because we don't serve them, but Mm -hmm. most provinces are two. So what that means is, let's say I'm going to use me as an example. Let's say today I stop paying my credit card. Okay. Obviously, the bank is going to take action on me, right? They're going to start out with a gentle, loving call to say, hey, Stace, you know, we noticed you missed your payment. And then the gentle, loving calls start to be less gentle and less loving, right? Mm -hmm. But obviously, it goes into collections. Let's say for whatever reason, I'm not paying. They have two years to collect on that. So I live in BC and you're in Ontario. Mm -hmm. It's two years, right? If they don't take action by within two years, it's actually considered statute barred. So after two years, if I've not made any payments and they've not been able to collect, they can't do anything anymore. Interesting. But they will report into your credit report or your credit bureau. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll report in for six or seven years, depending on um, the province you live in. So they'll but get you some way. Li- yeah. Yeah. But there's limitations to um, how long a, a, an organization can collect on. Now, um, another question that I really wanted to ask you, and it's something that a lot of people are wondering as well. Um, if somebody's parents pass, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. do you end up inheriting their debt? No, unless you have a joint debt or a cosign debt. So let's pretend, so my father's still alive. Let's, and we don't have joint debt Mm -hmm. upon his passing. If he has debt, 
it will pass with him. And so what I mean by that is that the creditors, the estate will pay up the creditors. And let's say he had no estate, let's say he died broke and poor, um, then the creditors can try and go to the estate. But if there's nothing, there's nothing. And so it dies, I mean that respectfully, but it dies with him. Mm -hmm. They Mm -hmm. don't come after me, his daughter to come and pay. Okay. Yeah. Now, if I've co-signed it, yes, they will absolutely come come to me. (laughs) And I and and you know I I, that comes up again, right? That whole Mm -hmm. co-sign thing comes up to haunt you yet again. Sure, it does. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, if I'm worried about my debt, Mm -hmm. and I have the courage to come out and speak with someone, Mm -hmm. what do I do? Who do I speak with? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know what? We always encourage people and I appreciate, you know, I, I own my bias, you know, working for a nonprofit credit counseling agency that my recommendation is always a nonprofit credit counseling agency first. Mm -hmm. The reason why is a, the services are free and the information you walk away with a plan. Now, sometimes it's, you know, here, we're going to show you how to DIY it Mm -hmm. and we'll follow up if you need help. Sometimes it's a debt management program and sometimes it's actually, you know what, you need a legal solution. So I'm going to refer you to a trustee that treats our clients with dignity and respect and acts ethical in the, in the financial space. Yeah. So credit cards, Mm -hmm. you know, I, everybody knows that the credit card debt, um, it, it compounds. Mm -hmm. A lot of people just want to pay the minimum because they think that just paying the minimum is, is good enough. Mm -hmm. I, I, I keep telling the story that, um, you know, when I got married in in 2019, we had one more bill that arrived. Mm -hmm. It was Mm -hmm. on a credit card and it, you know, it was $13,000 was, was the, the total of the credit card bill. Mm -hmm. And it said, if I paid the minimum, which was $10, Mm -hmm. It would take me 108 years and nine oh months God. to pay this. Right. So never mind how much it would yeah. cost if okay. you know with the compounded interest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk about the importance of compounded interest and paying more than just your minimum. Absolutely. Yes. You know, so I've got the example of on a five thousand dollar credit card bill at 19.9%. If I make Two percent, so minimum payments on a declining balance. So I would start out with one hundred dollars to ninety nine to ninety eight. It'll take me sixty five years. I will be long gone. Like I, I, I'll have booked it way before that thing gets paid off. And so what? Is, yeah, compound interest is okay. So my five thousand dollar bill that has interest on it. Now it's going to be interest upon interest, and so on and so on. And so when I make minimum payments. That minimum payment goes mostly to interest and very little to principal, which is why you can't get out of debt. And so even making, Liz, five extra dollars, literally five extra dollars brings it down or $10, right? That actually brings down the cost it, and it brings down the time that it takes to pay it up, even five or 10 extra dollars. And if you can throw on more, go, go for it. And I think that's really important because a lot of people have wrapped their brain around the fact that, oh, I'm paying the minimum, so I'm okay. Mm-hmm. The minimum mm-hmm. payment is is what it says on the statement. And I think people need to wrap their brain around the fact that, yes, an extra $5, an extra $10, mm-hmm. pay off your credit cards every month if you can. I yeah. mean, that's the goal. Well, the irony is that on your credit rating for that product, so let's say on my visa, if I make minimum payments, it'll be a one which is the best I can have. Mm -hmm. If I make like minimum payments plus $10, it's still a one. And if I pay it off in full, it's still a one. So there's no consequence to just making minimum payments. And not that I think we want to punish people, but they all three do the same thing. And when we make minimum, we become a society of minimum payments and that's all fine until something goes south in your life. And when you cannot afford it. Something like a pandemic. Right. Right. I don't want to laugh, but like no one, like we didn't expect this. No one did. No one had this in their plan. No one had this for an emergency fund. Nobody, uh, I mean, nobody planned this out. And all of a sudden here we all are in panic Mm -hmm. mode because as we'd said earlier, some people are just drowning and struggling in debt and Mm -hmm. others are are fine and and, and not hurt by it at all. And we need to protect ourselves for the next pandemic. Absolutely. Well, and you know, what worries me is that, you know, there's a lot of the media around, like people are saving money and they're spending on big ticket items. That's great for those that have 
you know, I, I'm going to call it privilege. I'm privileged enough to be able to work from home, you know, and keep my job. But there are a lot of Canadians that are not doing so well and are struggling. And because they've racked up the debt and now they're at their limit, yeah. the minimum payments, they can't access it anymore, right? So it reduces the options and it reduces your freedom to make choices that work for you. And that's like just debt it. Is like a we, shackle. Mm -hmm. we need people to come and talk to you so mm -hmm. that their choices, they have choices, they have many choices yes. and they're not reduced. So in closing, let's talk about people's relationship with money. Mm -hmm. um, is it healthy or is it not healthy? And what does it tell us? I think some people have a really healthy relationship with money, right? Like, you know, like anything. And I think a lot of us struggle with our relationship with money because we don't consider it a relationship. It's just money. Yeah. It's just my budget. Like, it's just money. It's my income. It's just my expenses. No, you have a relationship with it. And I think, you know, I think especially for women, we really need to get to know our money. You know, we need to know our history and our values. And, you know, that was something that was really important for me is understanding what stressed me out about money? And then under that is a value. I value security and I value freedom. So now I can make choices that align with that. Like, does that give me more freedom or more security? No. Okay. Do I need it? Nah, maybe not. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important for us to develop a relationship with money and get to know it and get to know what, what works for us and what doesn't. There's literally no right way to budget. There's the way that works for you. And, you know, it, I, I love the fact that you said, you know, we women, we need to know our value with money. That's one of the reasons why I started finances personally, yes. because for every dollar a man makes, a woman makes 87 cents. Yeah. We mm -hmm. don't have a linear career like men do. We, we work, we stay at home for kids, mm -hmm. we go to work, then we mm -hmm. have to stay at home for parents or, or somebody mm -hmm. we're caregiving. Um, mm -hmm. Then, you know, we can't find um, childcare. We, mm -hmm. then we have to stay at home for that. Um, and then we live longer as well. So we've mm -hmm. had to learn how to do everything yes. with less money mm -hmm. than men. Um, and we've just had to make it work. And that's yeah. one of the reasons why I did this. Oh, absolutely. And you know what? For me as a woman, I think it's so crucial that I know my money in the sense of, and I love my husband. I would take a bullet for this man. Like he is my person. And I am in this relationship by choice. Mm -hmm. I'm not here because I have to be. Yeah. And that gives me the freedom to be, you know, the best person I can be, the best you know, partner I can be. But it also means I don't have to stay if things go south because I'm financially stuck. Yeah. And that's a tragedy, right? When women are stuck because of their finances. I, I totally agree with you. And I think that's the best note to end on. Um, you know, we started by talking about, you know, having separate bank accounts mm -hmm. or not separate, but having yeah. your own mm -hmm. bank account. Absolutely. Because, and your own credit uh, card. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, because, you know, things happen, divorces happen, uh, mm -hmm. situations happen, mm -hmm. and we need to be able to stand on our own two feet that's right. and, and hopefully not come and see you. Yeah. And if you can't, that's okay, right? But at least if you come and see a professional, then you'll know your options. And that kind of knowledge is power. And that's power for men, women, like everyone, right? When you know what options you have, you actually have power to make good decisions. Thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you, Liz. Debt causes stress, anxiety, embarrassment, arguments, and so many other feelings. Now, we keep thinking that we can fix anything by ourselves and that we have things under control. But the key is that you never have to be alone as there are so many professionals that can help guide you and set you up on a path to becoming debt-free. Always reach out to a credit counseling organization, especially if things have gone too far. They can help you and it's free. But the catch is that you need to reach out and ask for help. Now, if you like this video, click like, please read the disclaimer in my YouTube description because it really is important. And please look out for my next episode and remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel. You'll automatically get new video alerts and please follow me on Twitter at Enamovsky. Thank you so much for watching. Bye for now.